Live from KSAT 12, the night beat starts right now. The plan is to do more with less Why a local school district thinks cutting down to four days in the classroom could actually be good for its teachers. And how did we get here? The city of San Antonio dealing with more than 50 construction projects. Some of them have businesses struggling to survive. So is the city holding contractors accountable when deadlines are delayed or mistakes are made? And plus health inspectors visit two restaurants, one of them inside a strip club. The violations that had the city concerned for customers when we go behind the kitchen door. But first, the clock ticking a total of 54 construction projects are happening in San Antonio and city leaders say 89% of them are considered what they call on time. Now, technically projects could be considered on time if a deadline is pushed back and approved by the city. Now, right now, a roadway along the St. Mary Strip is set to open up in March, but that could be way too late for nearby businesses. The night team's John Paul Barajas asked the city about what goes into holding contractors accountable. It's a common sight around San Antonio that many try to avoid, which is why some businesses say construction is running them into the ground. It's impossible for, for us to continue uh, doing business on Broadway. We have no choice but to close the business down. Um, we're thinking early spring. The barricades surrounding Augie's barbecue limit access. It's the same issue on the North St. Mary Strip. Sometimes even more challenging than what we did, you know, dealt with during COVID, which is a lot to say out loud. We're looking at, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars in lost revenue that just me personally that I've been dealing with, but I'm not unique. When the city accepts contractor bids for each construction project, Assistant City Manager Ron Sanchez says they usually have to take the least expensive one unless... We've had a really bad experience, had to fire somebody. There was, you know, really bad, you know, they're really super late on something. You know, those are folks who want to award the contract to. Sanchez adds contractors are fined for each day they go over deadline. The fines vary by the location and size of the project. As for mistakes made? They have to eat the cost and eat the time. Razi Husseini with Public Works tells us on the strip, a sewer line was put in at the wrong elevation by a subcontractor. That company was hired by the city-selected contractor, Spaglass. What we're going to look at in that case is how did they handle it? And in this case, they, they fired that contractor and brought some, someone in. So I think you know, that was that was responsive on their part. City officials say that contractors can be awarded multiple projects at the same time. Businesses with current construction that I spoke to aren't happy about that. As the selection process, Assistant City Manager Rod Sanchez says that City Council is expected to discuss a responsible bidder's ordinance next week. He hopes that will give them more say on the contractor selected going forward. On Broadway, John Paul Barajas, Kisa, 12 News. Story will continue to follow. Thank you, John Paul. Right now, Bear County deputies trying to find this man. They believe 25-year-old De Leon Taylor Griffin may know something about a double murder this morning. Right now, he's only a person of interest in this case. Bear County deputies say they found two bodies outside an apartment complex on, complex on Mansions Bluff. That's off Highway 90 west of Loop 1604. Investigators say they believe an argument over car keys led to the death of those two men this morning. So far, one woman under arrest, 42-year-old Sharice Wiley Taylor, facing a charge of capital murder. Again, the case is not closed yet. Here's another look at the man deputies are looking for as a person of interest in this case. If you know where 25-year-old De Leon Taylor Griffin is, call the Bear County Sheriff's Office at 210-335-6000. Developing tonight, a potential shift in the school schedule. Another local school district is considering a four-day school week. Lavernia ISD is discussing it, and now Harlandale ISD is exploring that option to keep teachers. As the night team's Patty Santos explains, Harlandale ISD now wants to hear from families. First grade teacher Samantha Santos says teaching gives her joy. I love being there for these kids. But after five years, she knows it can take a toll on her health and family. I don't always have time for to plan as effectively as I want and to take care of myself and my family. And as a mother and teacher, she supports moving to a four-day school day. It would force her to make time for important errands and appointments. 
I hate missing instruction with my kids, so I always, at my own personal needs, I put them off. This week, Heartlandale parents and teachers received a survey about the possible calendar change. It would eliminate classes on Monday and extend school days by a few minutes. The district says it has limited funds for raises, but three-day weekend would give teachers time to plan and de-stress. We want to be proactive and um, sometimes that means being different. Other Texas districts have made the change. But what we have seen is that it has a huge impact on the mental health, on the uh, morale of the teachers. Grandparent Mary Lou Garcia has not seen the survey yet, but it's a no for her. Not all of us have daycare. Not all of us can afford daycare, and the way I see it, it's just, it's not convenient. The district is exploring the possibility of opening a few schools on Mondays for child care, but Santos strongly asks the community to consider giving teachers a day to reset. This is something new. Um, we're leading the path in this journey, um, and it's always scary when we start, but eventually other districts will see how well um, it's taking care of our students and teachers. And the district has about 12,000 students and about 2,000 teachers. They hope to hear from the majority of these families in the next couple of weeks. Now, uh, they want to make it very clear that this is just a survey. Before they make any changes to next year's calendar, they say there's going to be a lot of board meetings and it has to be approved by the school district. We're going to continue to follow this story and bring you more as we get that information. We'll send it back to you. Patty, thank you. In other news now, there is a pattern in the strategy that lawyers are taking to defend Andrea McDonald. The Air Force major is accused of killing his wife. His trial hasn't started, but today, for a second day, his legal team tried to get evidence thrown out. The defense team brought up multiple searches of the home and in one case argued that investigators went into the McDonald's home without a warrant. There's no fact that would justify a conclusion of an ongoing emergency. We have a warrantless entry into the home. Now, they also questioned whether Bear County deputies had the correct warrants. Andreen McDonald was first reported missing in 2019, and months later, her remains were found in North Bear County. Her mother had told the court that she allowed deputies inside of the home first. And today, prosecutors argued that deputies had probable cause to look a second time after finding that a garage door was off of its hinges. The defense says that tomorrow it plans to show why other pieces of evidence should also be dismissed in the case. And by the way, in all of this, a judge is the one who's going to make the final call. The trial itself is set to begin on Monday. You may have seen clouds of smoke billowing into the air from not one but two fires, one of them on the southwest side of the city, another further south. Let's start with the fire on the southwest side. Flames at a scrap metal facility on Frio City Road, sending smoke up for miles. The good news is no one was hurt, but this isn't the first fire to happen here. The San Antonio Fire Department tells us it's a common problem. Over the last five years, there have been eight fires at this location. The other fire sparked up in a junkyard near Mellon Street and Hidalgo Avenue. It's on the south side of the county. Firefighters say it started as an unauthorized burn that got out of control. No one hurt. Still unclear whether anyone is facing a fine in this. And now for a look at some of today's big headlines in your Nightbeat News Flash. Crime Stoppers keeping a cold case in the spotlight. It's offering a $5,000 reward to anybody who helps them catch the person who killed this man, and that is Jesse Solis. He was killed three years ago. Jesse Solis was found with a gunshot wound to his face at a construction site in Northeast Bear County. And investigators believe the suspect may have known that Solis was carrying large amounts of money. So if you know anything about this, Call the number on your screen. It's 210-224-STOP. A death on a movie set and disregard for safety. That is what prosecutors say led to charges against actor Alec Baldwin and a woman who supervised the weapons on a movie set in New Mexico. Santa Fe's district attorney announced charges of involuntary manslaughter. Baldwin pointed a pistol at the film cinematographer Helena Hutchins before the gun went off killing her in 2021. An attorney for Baldwin says that the charge is a miscarriage of justice. Now the lawyer for the woman who supervised the weapon says that his client did not commit a crime. Here at home, St. Mary's University has a prescription to cure a projected nursing shortage in Texas. The university's president said the institution is going to launch a nursing program because analysts predict that in 2032, Texas is going to be short 50,000 nurses. Construction for a new nursing campus started back in October, and it should be finished 
by next year. And that's a look at your Nightbeat Newsflash. You still head on the night beat. A local strip club gets the city's attention. What health inspectors uncovered inside the club's restaurant when we go behind the kitchen door. All right. Also a heads up for your summer vacation. Southwest Airlines could be having some pilot problems. I know the changes the airline says it's made, but pilots say still not enough. We'll discuss it next on the night beat. Sorry to tell you, but more trouble for Southwest Airlines. Its pilots are now considering a strike. This is after the holiday meltdown, of course, where thousands of flights were canceled. The airline says that they're back on schedule now, and it hopes to prevent another major issue with the budget of more than a billion dollars to upgrade its outdated computer systems. Now, the pilots union says the company also needs to change the way that it schedules pilots. Both sides have been negotiating for years, but they're at a standstill. That's where they're failing. And that really, you can spend a billion dollars on on IT, but if the processes are the same, you're going to get the same output. So in an effort to get those changes made, more than 10,000 Southwest pilots are going to have until the end of May to vote on the strike. Federal labor, labor officials would also have some input in all this. New tonight, dancing, not the only thing dirty inside a San Antonio strip club. A health inspector said the entire place was filthy and in need of a deep cleaning. The night team's Tim Gerber uncovers their other violations and more as he takes us behind the kitchen door. D'Angelo's Italian Grill, located inside Capiche Gentlemen's Club at the 4200 block of Sungate Street, danced across the stage to a score of 81 on their most recent health inspection. The inspector noting the entire establishment was in need of a general deep cleaning. The floors and walls were dirty in the kitchen. Equipment in the kitchen was also dirty with debris, and a ventilation hood system filters were covered in grease buildup. That's not all. Utensils and food containers stored as clean were dirty with debris. There were gnats in the bar area, and the inside of the ice machine was dirty with black residue. Five of the violations were corrected during the inspection, but the business was also in need of a current permit. Pancho's Mexican restaurant in the 1000 block of Old Highway 90 earned an 83 on their December inspection. The inspector found a bucket of cut potatoes being stored on the ground below a hand sink where splash contamination could occur. Food stored in a refrigerator was uncovered under dirty food debris on wire racks. Dishes were being washed, but the water didn't have any sanitizer in it. The freezer wasn't cold enough. The reach and cooler shelves were coated with food debris and there was caked on grease on the sides of the grill and other kitchen equipment. Employee medications and even cologne were also found in the kitchen area near a food prep area. A reinspection was ordered and they were told to renew their expired food license. The Picnic Foods located in the 1200 block of South General McMullen improved upon its previous score of 72 when a health inspector visited in late November. She gave the store an 83. They still had to toss out all of the produce in the walk-in cooler that had mold on it. The ice machine had a red and black substance growing on the inside. There was no valid food manager and their food license had not been renewed. Beer cans, pickles and other food items were exposed to contamination from missing ceiling tiles. The fryers and grills were coated in an accumulation of grease and food debris and so were the kitchen floors. They also needed to remove duct tape from all of the freezers. A follow-up inspection was required. Tim Gerber, KSAT 12 News. On a lighter note now, <laughs> let's take things outside. Yeah, that's Sky 12 over the Pyramid Building. So Look how cool right that is. Yes, it's such a, a cool shot. Yeah, it's a cool looking building. I've never been inside. I don't think there's, there's a Sphinx in there or anything, but... <laughs> You know. Oh, now you got me wondering. It'd be kind of cool if there was. Nice to look at. And I'm, what I'm looking at are the temperatures, 58 degrees, and it's going to be a little cooler tomorrow, Adam. Yeah, you know, that's going to be about our high temperature tomorrow afternoon. You're going to notice the cooler conditions and this overall cooler pattern tomorrow. And temperatures will go up and down a little bit in the days ahead, but generally speaking, we are sinking back into a cooler pattern with temperatures below average. Tomorrow morning, we're at 47. By noon, 54, and then a high temperature 
of only 58. I mean, we're going to struggle to hit 60 all across our area. Maybe a few readings at or slightly above 60. Uvalde, Sabinel could make it up to 62. I think those will be the exceptions tomorrow. Then we warm back to near 70 for Sunday and Monday. But then next week, with a stronger system moving in Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, below average for high temp temperatures. So a big shift in what we're seeing out there. All right, let's take a look at our rain chances. That's important too. I'm really not too keen on the next few days. Tomorrow, yeah, maybe a sprinkler too. So we threw in a 10% whoop de doo right? Saturday, 20%. That's just for some very light rain early in the morning. Gaining confidence and optimism in Tuesday's system. I think uh, that gives us the best potential. So we bumped it up to a 40% chance for now. Of course, a lot can change between now and then. So check back in for updates. The system is still up near Alaska. We're going to show you it in just a moment. We need the rain. We're actually in the worst drought all across the state, right here in our backyard. We're talking San Antonio, most of Bear County, get into Medina County, Bandera County, Kerr, Kendall, Comal. Yes, the same areas for the past several weeks and even months in the extreme and exceptional drought. Really, a lot of this is since March. Go to the coast, just fine, not even abnormally dry. Same story with East Texas. A-OK, -okay. you go to West Texas. Actually in decent shape. Parts of the panhandle do have extreme drought, but really the worst drought all across the Lone Star State right here. We need the rain. We will take all that we can get. Here's the pattern. Two systems all wound up, one over the Great Lakes and then another one over the western U.S. This is the one that's bringing some good heavy snowfall to the Rocky Mountains. And then let's not forget our Tuesday system. It's still way off in the Pacific. We're talking just south of the Aleutian Islands. It's going to make it its way into Canada and then dive southward. And if it dives just south enough, we could increase our rain chances even more for Tuesday. So let's cross our fingers for that. Let's focus on the short term here, though. We got to get through the next few days. A little bit of energy sliding overhead from Mexico, and it's going to give us, I think, significant cloud cover tomorrow. Maybe a sprinkle, mostly Virga, the rain that evaporates before it hits the ground. We get into Saturday. Here's our future cast. Just a few little measly sprinkles here and there, probably adding up to just a few hundredths of an inch and then drying out pretty quickly as we get into Saturday afternoon. Even a clearing line from west to east throughout the day on Saturday. 62 on Saturday by Sunday, sunny and 68. Notice on Monday, a cool morning at 38, but by the afternoon, we're at 70 degrees. Then those temperatures fall off next week. That Tuesday morning system showers and even some thunderstorms possible with that. Of course, a lot of time between now and then, but look at those mornings back down in the mid 30s by the middle part of next week. I was going to show you a great photo, and of course, it just knocked offline. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> this happens every time. Every time, time without <laughs> fail. Look, we need a counter to put on the screen and just tally it up yeah. every time. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my goodness. We had a great sunset, though. We did. Thank you, Adam. Yeah, you're, we trust you, Adam. You're welcome. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Is the Cowboys team the team that finished the year against the Washington Commanders or the team that just played Tampa Bay. I think we're going to find out on Sunday. I, I think it's a team that played Tampa Bay is going to show up on Sunday against San Francisco. And mentioning that name, is this the team that Dak really wanted after his unbelievable performance in Wild Card Weekend? We will ask him. And the Astros pay a special visit to Uvalde coming up. Pro football coverage, powered by Davis Law Firm. For the second straight day, uh, day safety J. Ron Curse was limited in practice after he injured his knee in the third quarter. The Dallas Cowboys 31-14 victory over Tampa Bay in the wild card weekend. So was defensive end Demarcus Lawrence nursing that nagging foot injury. A lot has been made about the Cowboys being shortchanged in the preparation time since they played on Monday Night Football. In fact, the 49ers will actually get two extra days of preparation when you consider they played Saturday afternoon against Seattle to advance to the NFL Divisional Playoffs and are playing at home negating the travel day. But here's an interesting stat. The Cowboys are 2-0 in games where they've been played only five days to prepare. And Mike McCarthy is 5-1 in the last six outings. That included a short week following an appearance on Monday Night Football. We've played in all the different combinations of, you know, six day week, seven, you know, seven day week, eight day week. So we, we, you know, this is nothing new for us. So we, we don't, we, we, we haven't had a schedule or won't have a schedule that we don't have experience in because, you know, so much of your preparation is about the flow and the specifics of, you know, get, getting things perfect and because, you know, perfect preparation is, is attainable. And, um, and that's, that's just, you know, that's our approach weekly. 
Meantime, Dallas Cowboys star quarterback Dap Prescott coming off his 305-yard passing game that included three touchdowns in the air, another one on the ground, and the win over Tom Brady and the Buccaneers. His last day at the San Francisco 49ers in the next round of the playoffs is exactly the team he wanted. Most definitely I did. Um, I think this whole team did. Um, obviously, using that loss last year as a, as a motivation and just kind of um, the, the focal point, I guess, of the resiliency that, that we carried uh, into the offseason, obviously carried into this year. Um, yeah, we get a chance to, to, to um, go back and um, at their place, uh, do do something that, that we want to do. All right, kickoff Sunday in Santa Clara will be at 5.30 p.m., but we'll start our live coverage from California starting tomorrow at 5 p.m. Meantime, in Arlington, the San Antonio Brahmas continue their training camp with their first year ever in the XFL, set to kick off one month from today here in the Alamo City at the Alamo Dome. Their head coach, two-time Super Bowl champion Heinz Ward, was asked about his team's performance in their first ever week together. It's been great. I mean, it's a learning process being together for the first time on the, on, the, on the football field. You can see the excitement. A lot of times it's all about how do you practice. We just don't want to have no foolishness out here, somebody falling over someone and getting injured. So I think this week has really been about a learning curve, one, getting in shape and learning how to practice so we can move forward. All right, the Brahmas will kick off their season on Sunday, February the 19th, 2 p.m. against the St. Louis Battlehawks in the Alamo Dome, live right here on KSAT 12. San Antonio Spurs return to the practice court today to get ready for the L.A. Clippers, who come calling tomorrow night. It will be interesting to see if Kawhi Leonard suits up after he's held out of the Jazz loss last night. He's not on the Clippers injury report tonight. Keldon Johnson is coming off his career high with 36 points when the Spurs snapped out of their five-game losing streak against the Brooklyn Nets. Since five of his six 30-point games have come when Vassella is out, does he feel the need to pick up the slack when Devin is down? Not really. I feel like I just, I just kind of... Do what my team need me to do, take what the defense is giving me. You know, um, you know, I, I think uh, for me and Dev, it'll be a lot of games in the future where we both have 30 or Dev have 30. But I, I don't really think there's no correlation. I feel like, um, you know, he, he can do it all. So just having him out there is definitely good. We can't wait to have him back. All right, tip time tomorrow night, 7 p.m. We begin our live coverage at 5 p.m. The world champion Houston Astros traveled to Uvalde to help the community heal. Next. What a very special day as members of the 2022 World Series champion Houston Astros caravan made a stop in Uvalde today. Third baseman Alex Bregman, pitcher Lance McCullers Jr. and broadcaster Francisco Romero paid visits to the children of Flores Elementary School and later Uvalde Elementary School this morning. Heck, they even brought the World Series trophy with them to share with the Uvalde community at their Civic Center. Hopefully these kids that um, we saw today in the classroom and um, we met last year at Minute Maid Park uh, dream big and and maybe uh, you never know maybe one of them is a future Astro in that room I know that uh, the Astros the Astros Foundation are gonna do everything in their power to to be there for Uvalde and what a special day as the Astros are the latest healthy Uvalde community heal in the wake of the Rob Elementary mass shooting deaths they claim 21 lives the Valero Texas Open held their media day today where they bring back the defending champion who this year will be JJ Spawn at the clubhouse of TPC San Antonio located at the JW Marriott Resort course Spawn won his first ever PGA Tour event last year in San Antonio and won his first trip ever to the Masters and followed by shooting the final round of 69 to finish at 13 under it holds a special place in my heart, you know, even the whole community and even down to the restaurants, you know, it's like this is this is my spot. So uh, I feel like I earned that title and and I'm yeah excited to defend. The 2023 Valero Texas Open be held from March 27th to April the 2nd. Get this tomorrow at 5 o'clock. We're going to be live at the Spurs game at 5 o'clock here in San Antonio, Texas. Yeah. And we'll be live from Santa Clara, California to get you ready for the big game between the Cowboys and the 49ers. Man, you got it covered. We're ready. Yeah, you're Thanks. all over. Thank you. We'll be right back. We want you to see what a 12 year old caught off the coast of Florida. Look at that. Yeah. Campbell Keenan was deep sea fishing when he reeled in a great white shark took. It actually took Keenan and two professionals about 45 minutes to catch the 10 foot 450 pound female. The charter company says that it's just the third great white that's been caught in the area in 20 years. So they snapped some photos, tagged the shark, and then they did the right thing. They released her right back into the ocean. Now that's a 12 year old who has something to brag about. Yes. What did uh, you do this weekend? Oh, caught, caught a, a shark. great white. Yeah. No biggie. I had to show you that photo, but since we're on the subject here, come on, come on, come on, come on. Yes. Oh, I was going to get to my ice fishing trip for you. Oh, I couldn't show you my big whopper that I pulled through the ice, but we Aww. did. Good night.